Well, welcome back. Uh, it's, it's, can you hear me? Is it a little loud? So, all right, thanks. So again, welcome back. Uh, today is really the, the last lecture of the series. Uh, what I want to do today is to wrap up the whole session and uh, really everything culminates back into the final system of uh, power budgets and so on. I'll, I'll go through that today. Um, at the same time, I also give some instructions for the final exam that is going to be next week. So next week, at this time, is going to be the final exam. Um, so let's get started. So this last lecture, uh, session 14, is really a combination of 14 and 15. 15 I keep kept as a floating uh, lecture, basically to, to, to catch up on things that, uh, that were uh, not fully covered, or there are some special questions, and so on. So, uh, but I, I've managed to cover the whole course in these lectures. So today I'm going to wrap up that. Um, as I said, the our system class, the, the, the final task is to really, so all the things that we learned about in the systems design, the environments, the subsystem interfaces, um, then uh, a lot about power generation, the solar, the nuclear, um, the then energy storage uh, devices, and then we talked about the CMAD, and a lot of other electrical systems and then, uh, which I, we talked last time. And finally, all the power system guides, what they do, the end of the day is to come up with, uh, do the system analysis, and come up with what is called the power budget. So, and so what I'll do today is to, to show how do we do this power budget, what does it mean, what are the different kinds of power budgets, what are the things that have to be included in the power budget, why is it so important to get the power budget to really bring that? So that's what I'm going to focus on today. That really is a culmination of everything uh, on that. <coughs> and of course, I mean, this is a, uh, still a, uh, although it's a power system course, but as you can see, I basically touched on some of the subjects. Each of the subjects that I touched on, I can spend, uh, I can put a whole class on this solar. I mean, I can spend a whole class, 40 hour, uh, entire semester in just solar cell design. I can talk about the whole class in just on battery cell technology. Or or uh, I can spend a whole class on doing the VMAX, the different uh, electronic architectures and so on that I think that are so important. So what I've tried to do is the uh, same thing with space environments. The, the space environments is a whole subject by itself. We can spend an entire uh, semester What I've done, what I've tried to do is to cover enough topics in some de in, in just about enough detail to you start understanding the vocabulary, you understand the terms, you understand the keys, and where do we go and get the information from? This kind of introduction. And same thing I do with power budgets, to show what are the key elements that go into the budget, what are the key things that you need to look for in the analysis. And again, just being a system guy, I want to about the interfaces to other subsystems because we don't we don't design power systems. Power system uh, exper experts are key and they are always in the middle of the whole system design. So they interface what they do affects everybody and vice versa. So it's very important to understand the, 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 the so we talk about those. And then um, maybe some of the thing that the big things that are happening in the future space mission uh, if we have time, we'll, uh, we'll cover some of those aspects too. <coughs> All right, so, uh, <coughs> so some of the housekeeping details. And again, I'll have to start obviously in the package, so you have some written numbers. And, but uh, first of all, this, as I said, this is the, our session will be complete with this. Today is going to be the final session. Uh, <coughs> um, 
Um, I will post this notes also today or later tomorrow so you have everything that you need to uh, buy uh, in a day or two. As far as homeworks are concerned, homework six was the last homework. I'm not going to give any more. Um, and uh, the response is due back by May 4th. I will have plenty of time for that. There were a lot of questions on homework four, homework six. I will try to address some of those questions this, this class. Uh, and, uh, and again, if you have, there have been a lot of questions in the last uh, couple of weeks or so, because the exams are coming, I guess everybody is now brushing up their notes, which is good. So keep, keep doing that. I will be, uh, uh, to make sure I'm not, I'm not traveling anywhere, the last, last week or so I've kept my calendar free. I've been in town. I intend to do the same next week too, so this way um, I can answer any questions that you have. Midterms, I've already posted the solutions on the on the web. I think you got that. Um, and midterms are important because the you can, you, if you do the midterms right, you, that is also getting get ready for the final exam. The final exam format is going to be pretty much the same as. Set of questions and uh, and um, also some uh, uh, a multiple choice. So let's talk about finals. Next week finals, May six. The time actually is at seven p.m. to nine p.m. But you know, please be here at uh, say no later than four o'clock, quarter to seven. So we're gonna take some time to get this started. So obviously, this, the session starts at six uh, six forty. So try to be here at 640, but the exam will start at 7. It's basically a two-hour exam. So, so somebody has had a question of the duration of the exam, that's the time, it's nine to 7 to 9. So I'll adjust my questions and go to, to, to be, uh, you know, be able to, but it's about a two-hour time. The exam coordinator. Um, the staff coordinator is uh, Mr. Case Al Qureshi. Uh, that's his uh, and and his. You can access him or talk to him or send him an email uh, on that website uh, on that email address. Um, then exam at usc.edu is the best place to contact him. And apparently, he is here uh, nine nine to five during the weekdays. I have his number too, but I have not talked to him yet. So. But I can at least uh, give you his uh, email address. For, the, for those who are going to get the exam on site, the room is going to be this. I talked to the Denton folks uh, uh, earlier today. They said it is going to be this particular room. Uh, but again, uh, somebody else told me that I have to, you, you have to be absolutely sure it needs to be confirmed. So I'm going to call back again. Uh, Mr. Qureshi, and ask to make sure that this is the room number. But, um, so as soon as I do that, I'll send an email to everybody uh, uh, confirming that this is the room number. But um, I'm 99% certain that this is the room number. For those who are going to give exams off-site, please coordinate the arrangements with the exam coordinator. Um, a lot of people will be uh, doing it off-site and, and different time zones altogether. So please coordinate your time. Uh, they, have, they, they, they make arrangements for uh, um, the respective universities or organizations, invigilators, and so on. It takes a lot of effort to organize off-site exams. But please coordinate it with the exam with the coordinator. I don't know the arrangements of individual students. You know, but so um, exam coordinator is the best person. If you have any problems doing it, give me a call or send me an email. Um, uh, <coughs> exam format, as I said earlier, is going to be very similar to the midterm. There will be some problem questions and then uh, multiple choice. So I want to make sure that you know uh, you don't get stuck in a, in a problem and, and so you, you, uh, and um, not be able to. And 
the idea is to really check and make sure that you have it will span across all the classes that are still uh, So it's going to be to the power generation, um, storage, some of the power budgets, some of the analysis that you've already done in your homework. It's going to be pretty much that. It's not, uh, believe me, I'm not, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to re try to wreck your brains in that exam. It's just to make sure that you have covered the exam, covered the course material, and, and hopefully when you go back and in the industry or whatever, and wear a power system hat in, in a team, you do justice to the team. And then you really, that, that's the exact, that's what I'm going to do, of course. Open book, this is not a memory test. So you're free to bring whatever material you want. Bring, bring your laptop, if you have your notes on that, no problem. You can bring all that. But, uh, Internet is online. So that's, I guess that's the best. So you can bring your laptops, but you can't Google for, uh, can't Google, uh, for the answers. OK. Uh, um, anything else? I think that's basically it. Any, any questions on the exam or the format or anything else? Uh, will you be having office hours? Hang on. Questions on this, so uh, I was wondering if you if you if you have office hours this week. Maybe. What do you mean office hours? Um, if you can if you have you know where people can come to you and ask questions. Oh, oh okay, okay, okay. Um, the question is if I have an office hour where I can, I'm available to ask questions. Uh, I was not planning to. Um, I was not planning to. Um, um, <clears throat> do you think that would help? Um, it might. I mean, I don't have anything right now, but you know, if I if I get the material. Yeah. If I do come across something that I'll like, I'll like to ask for it. All right, so, uh, so let me think about it. I was not planning to, to have an office hours for, for this class, but what I'll do is this. Uh, if you have questions, by all means send me a text or uh, send me an email. Uh, but send it, it's in my email on, on, send the email on my Gmail account or Boeing account. I don't check the uh, USC then. So please don't send me anything on USC then. I, I know that's hard to check. The other ones I can get directly on the Blackberry and I can, I, I know, I get the emails, at least I can respond. So I have my Boeing email come on them directly. You can send me on that or Gmail. So <coughs> I will try to respond back on email. Uh, and if there are questions that are common, so I will then respond back on an email. So it's it, it class email, so everybody gets the same answer. If still, if it doesn't satisfy, the, if, if you really need to have this, give me a call, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll answer, you know, I'll, I'll either uh, spend some time, either come over and, and help you out. So let's take it, so let's, uh, the answer is, I'm not planning any office hours. If there is a need, and if you cannot be satisfied to by the phone, by the email, I will do it. Is that fair? Sure. Okay, so that's where it is. This chart is going to be in your notes. So any, if you have any questions, uh, please. And I will try to, before we end the class, again go through some of this so we make sure that anybody who's missed it gets a great day. All right, let's keep going. Um, usual reminder. So today what I'm going to do is to talk about this whole chart. I mean, we've seen this continuously. So today really is trying to wrap up the whole thing. When you're doing the power budget, and look, now looking at not a power system, being a power systems uh, uh, person, that's the center of the world, but you need to, when you do power budgets, you need to uh, understand exactly all those interfaces, all the loads, and the effects on all subsystems, and the effects in, in terms of environments, environmental effects, and then generation, storage, and management. So really wrapping up the whole thing together, uh, <coughs> including some 
launch uh, requirements and electrical propulsion and all those all those things will be really put together in the final product. Again, um, what I'll try to do is some of these charts that you've seen, I'll go fast and uh, spend more time on actual examples. So here is the an example of a, of a system, a power, a power system block diagram. Every phase class you work on, you will first thing you will draw is a, a, a the block diagram, system block diagram, to understand exactly how to put it together. And this is a single battery for one of the explosion. Functional, this is what it is. Essentially, all all of them will have some kind of solar arrays, some solar regulators that could charge, discharge the solar, and uh, and the bus loads and payload. Essentially, the same elements for every every problem. So <clears throat> when we do analysis, uh, here are the things that we are really looking for when we're putting this analysis together. First of all, the key driving requirements and considerations. Um, and then analysis will, will be, you have to do the, the nominal operation and contingency operation. So, uh, most of the space cars will be under normal operations or normal op operations as if, you know, everything is steady state, everything is operating as, as planned. So most of you want to make sure that, but life is not like that. You always end up in uh, abnormal operations. You know, sometimes there's a shadow that comes along, sometimes there's a failure, sometimes uh, things turn off unnecessarily, or un un unplanned, you have a lunar eclipse or space cart loses control and you, you're no longer pointing uh, for APS based stuff. Or all kinds of things happen or suddenly the temperature changes or the load starts changing. So there are a lot of un, uh, unplanned things or there's a fault in the system tripping the whole part of the system. And uh, you know now the load and um, generation goes off balance. So you've got to understand the normal operations as well as contingency. When we do power budget, we have to take care of all of these, both nominal as well as abnormal. Mm -hmm. Then the question of power margin. How, how much margin I can get? And then how much margin I, can, I should keep at the source, how much margin at the low? You know, what's the low margin? Uh, you've got to define that right off the bat before, before you do the analysis. And then the whole margin manage, how do I manage the margin as the design matures from a concept all the way to final power operation. Because if it's, you know, a margin is extra, you, it's a design thing, you don't want to give it away because it's free money. At the same time, if you cut it short in the beginning, you may end up in redesigning the system. So it's a fine tuning that you need to do. At the end, when you're final, finally operating, you want to have zero margin if you design everything perfect. Which means your analysis, all your things have to be but life is not that. You need to have some kind of margin, and how do I distribute that margin across the pro design cycle? Is the last line the question. And then the power budget analysis really is an energy balance analysis. Yeah. Unlike many other systems, the problem with power system is that you have a you have generation and you have a load. At all times, your generation must match the load. But the load is not never constant, so it's changing. So how do I match the generation to be exactly the same as the load at all times, instantaneously? Consider the inertia power. You, you plug in your, uh, your equipment in here. Um, you, again, you expect 120 volts, 50 hertz, an AC system, they are managing the load and generation exactly right. Because you have rotating machinery which has generators, that uh, the turbines are rotating at a certain frequency. If the load increases on this system, in AC systems, the motors will slow down because the motors, so they'll slow. The frequency drops. Vice versa, suddenly, if my load drops, generation goes up, that energy gets stored into the kinetic energy of the machine and they rev up, frequency goes up. So here, you're controlling, you're looking at the frequency and managing 
you got to make sure your uh, system is exactly right. It's much worse. And here there's a massive system, so there's enough inertia, you know, a lot of plus and minus can be accommodated. The smaller the system, the more difficult it becomes to do the balance. So instantly, especially in async and in DT systems, instantaneously, I have to manage and make sure the, the load, the, what, I, what I need is exactly what I generate. If not, I have excess generation capacity or excess uh, or my, I'm not meeting the load, the voltage turns off, power, power is off. So that is what this power budget analysis is really all about. How do I maintain energy balance under all phases of operation, from ground test, from launch vehicle, uh, while I'm spinning, um, coming out of the eclipse, uh, when I'm in sunlight, when I'm in eclipse, under all cases, I have to maintain power balance. That's what energy uh, power budget is all about. And then with that, then I have to do the sizing. And we have done a little bit of that. You know, how, how big is the solar array? How big is the battery? How big is the, how many, what kind of PMAT do you use? Um, so, and then, again, the vision that you have, know, whether it's a geo, leo, or highly elliptical orbit, or whatever. So that's the kind of thing I'm going to talk about today. Really, that really puts the whole thing together. <coughs> so, um, key interfaces to uh, electrical power. So here's the the, uh, the payload. Right? Yeah, the payload is the, the main reason why you have a spacecraft. So the payload is so you got to make sure you have your you're servicing the payload. Let you provide all the electrical power with the right power quality to the payload. Then you have uh, a thermal. I mean, this thing is going wildly, sometimes in sun, one part is in sun, in eclipse, or uh, even um, even when the spacecraft is in sunlight, one part of the spacecraft is in sun, the other is, is on the other side, so you have massive temperature fluctuation, sometimes 200, 300 degrees di differential temperature, and you have to maintain, uh, you've got to maintain the whole spacecraft thermally balanced, just like power. So. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of electric power is used to do the heating and call cooling of these, these systems. So that's an interesting reason to write about. Then ACS, and it's a control system. Spacecraft are turning, rolling, you at all kinds, you still have to point to the sun. Um, and you're, you're doing all kinds of maneuvers which will take electrical load. So uh, that's an effect. Propulsion system, of course. <coughs> has to be uh, managed. Then you have uh, uh, TNC, which is uh, telemetry in command, which is keeps control with the you know, spacecraft has to be controlled through ground, so all those interfaces um, have to be properly managed. And then uh, the structure, the whole thing goes and fits on the structure. Um, your, all your harnessing and your, your, the way you put the whole structure, you know, and then you a lot of things that you consider to be sure your CG is balanced or treat as this, and you're maintaining, um, uh, and your harness is, is routed through the heart, uh, through the structure. So there's a lot of constraints that go through uh, because of structure. And of course, all that has to be done reliably. It has to survive the environment and meet all these mission requirements and the contract requirements. So that those are the interfaces that we need to write. So uh, it all starts with requirements. Uh, the design flow is, uh, you start with a whole bunch of requirements, which are some of them, mission, spacecraft type, configuration, orbit altitude, inclination, load profile. You know, what is, what is, how is my load going to be? Should it be constant load, fluctuating load? Uh, so you have to understand, a lot of work goes on to really characterize the load of some, load profile. Uh, life, payload type, and, and so on. I, I think I've talked about this chart earlier. I can go through this a little fast, but this is what I'm going to summarize today. So we have all these requirements. Uh, payload growth requirements, allowable drift, autonomous operation. Autonomous operation meaning if I have no control. For example, you're putting a mission to Jupiter or Mars, right? um, or where, I mean, Jupiter, for example, is a 
5 AU. So it takes about 5 AU, it, it takes about 45 minutes from ground to, from doing a ground control. But then during the switch from ground, it will take 45 minutes for that signal to reach the spacecraft and for it to do something. And it will take another 45 minutes for the spacecraft to come back and tell me what it is. So I've got 90 minutes delay. There's no way I can control the electrical power system with 90 minutes delay. It has to have, there must, some, a lot of the operation has to be autonomous. It should take, if there's a fault, it can't tell the ground, hey, I have a fault, and then we send a command back, it's too late. It has to, if there's a short circuit, it has to take autonomous control. If it's lost something, it has a lot of sensors internally to be able to take those actions. That's what autonomous control is all about. For example, even if it is not that far, if it is in, in LEO or in GEO, spacecraft loses, loses control. It's not pointed to sign anymore. Perhaps, I don't know, and I've lost ground control. I can, we cannot afford to make the power, uh, the spacecraft, without power. So you have to have, you have to allow enough, you have to have uh, enough mechanism system that the spacecraft can survive uh, for X amount of time, maybe sometimes five days, six days, seven days. It should take all those actions autonomously for it to recover the spacecraft, still it become power stable and thermal stable. Then you establish ground links and you then take control. That's what autonomous we talked about reliability, the launch vehicle. Now all things, whole thing has to be on launch vehicle. So all the, the, all the interfaces has to be checked through launch vehicle. We've got to make sure the spacecraft is fully operational uh, and do a last, lot of last minute checks that has to be done. So all the interfaces has to go through, through the launch vehicle and then it will cost to do that. And of course, the whole thing has to be done within cost is taken. Um, Technology to be used, again, we go through in this class, bus architectures, um, solar array types, batteries, power electronics, and harness, like we talked about earlier. Uh, we take all that and then we start analyzing, but analysis really requires a lot of trade off. There is no one uh, size fits all. It's, you have to do a lot of trade depending on the mission, depending on the technology, depending on the requirement, the cost, the schedule. So there's a lot of trade-offs that needs to be done. And I try to talk about some of those trades in this class. <coughs> and then, uh, but then after all that, we trade and then you say, okay, this is the time system. Then you do a power budget, and then you do power budget for different operation modes. One is in the launch vehicle, there's a power budget. There's a launch, there's a power budget in the transport orbit phase. There's a power budget in the op normal operation mode. There's a power budget for shadow operations. There's a power budget when you have, a, when I'm doing, when, I, when there's a lunar eclipse. Power budget if, I, if there's an anomaly or an unsafe hold uh, condition. So th those are just to, to make sure under all conditions, all operational environments, every, um, it, we, 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 it has to be, the load must always be full. And, and then we need to, to do that, we also need to consider the operation. How am I pointing? Can, am I, can we do some maneuver, spacecraft maneuver? Sometimes I have a, if I have a particular, uh, can, can I, for example, looking at a particular point on Earth or some stars, am I constrained? It's a solar array constraint or a battery constraint. So there's a lot of operational considerations that need to be taken into account for each of those phases. How do we test it? As I said earlier, I keep saying it, test is one of the biggest expense in the whole spacecraft industry. If we don't design test it right off the bat, we pay a huge price. So test considerations have to be built in while you design. For solar arrays, for batteries, for electronics, make sure we have test access to electronics to be able to measure all the voltages and currents and, uh, and any other parameters you need have to be built in to be able to, uh, otherwise you can have a, a pretty complicated picture. And then that gives you final design selection. And this is, it's, it's an iterative process. You have to keep doing this over and over again till you optimize. So it's not, you just don't do it once and you get the right answer. Because it, there's a lot of uh, analysis and optimization that's done in that. 
And then finally, once you're done, you come up with the final design, you, you now you have selected that. Then you show, well, this is how I'm going to operate. This is my uh, a bus uh, uh, concept. This is a, uh, you put it fully regulated or sunlight regulated or battery on the bus or any of those options that I think. Um, this is what my total power uh, is, the beginning of flight power, end of flight power. And then with that, we can, I can show uh, this is how big the solar is, this is how big the battery is. All that, and then not only that, we can come up with the mass, weight, volume, cost, reliability, all those things are finally documented. So that's the kind of process we normally do. <coughs> so let's talk about power budget and power system analysis. And showing this cartoon here because it's all about this balance. And how do I how do I balance the load and source? So <coughs> it's really uh, under un where I want to be is a configuration like this: the generation is equal to load. That's what we want to be at all times, right? and that's true with any that's a terrestrial in space. It's, it's no different. This is an ideal state where the generation capacity exactly matches the load. Again, through all machine phases, instantaneous also. Otherwise, you know, you have a problem. You, you lose power quality. <coughs> That's what you want to say. So this is the nominal phase start operation. Again, under all phases, under normal operation, all the, that's what we want to look for. Uh, this is the case where your power quality is maintained. Again, when you plug into the system, there's no, I think wrong, but it, as soon as there's a short circuit somewhere, or load changes, or you know, uh, you can see, you know, again, for the fifth generation system, you don't see, but otherwise it's just more, if something, a, 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 an air conditioner turns on, for example, the voltage Which means the power quality is not good. <coughs> so, what happens if I have if my generation is higher than the load, right? Which means it was a normal state, and then suddenly what happened? One of the loads stripped, or one of the transponders got turned off. Now my load was now less than generation, so I end up in in this state, either intentionally or unintentionally. <coughs> Happens all the time. So this is, of course, non-ideal state. Uh, here, in this case, the generation capacity exceeds the loads <coughs> uh, to some or all machine phases. Um, this is, again, an abnormal condition. If it, is if it is sustained for some time, it's gone. But sometimes the power quality requirements that we talked about allow you to have those transients. So those electrical systems, those transients are usually in milli or microseconds. As long as you can take re and recover the action, and that happens as soon as you okay, you, you are off your voltage shifts, but then suddenly you take you, you fix your generation to make sure your generation is Of course, in this case, also the power quality is not good. Uh, this is the other case. And suddenly, I turn the load off, and I have my, now more load than the than generation capacity. Non-ideal state. Um, again, here, uh, same thing. So, so the trick is to to maintain this balance now. Now let's take, what does it really mean in terms of, uh, in this case? So, for example, you have a, um, you have typical geo satellite would have 80, 90 transponders, right? Different ch generation channels and everything. They are working through, and suddenly one transponder goes off. So, but solar array is still generating as much power. So what we, what we do is we start, the way we do it in the electrical system is, we start shunting some of the circuits. 
So it instantaneously you have a, the load goes up or goes down, but and the solar array is still pumping. So what I need to do is to shunt some of the circuits out. Instead of pumping the power back into the load, I have to just shunt it out into it. So the the the, the bus voltage regulator is really a shunt regulator. What you can do is you shunt the circuits one one at a time, such so that you maintain the voltage exactly. And the same thing that is done with the battery. Battery keeps what the battery is a, is a energy storage device. See, it actually stores excess energy in the battery rather than putting it back in the load. So, so uh, how do we design a, how do we come with a power budget? So, essentially, it looks like a busy chart, but let me walk you through it. It's not, uh, I think you'll see it's, it's kind of, uh, it's, it's pretty easy to. What it is. So we need to understand first what the payloads are. We need to understand, and I'll show you a chart of all the loads that we have. We need to make this chart. We have to make an Excel matrix in detail and we'll keep each and every piece of load that we have, both payload as well as bus load. Then, if there is any bus load that we have, I mean, if the bus load would be a heater load, there will be load for uh, processes that are running. There'll be Reaction wheels are running. There's a whole bunch of bus loads that, that, that the trans, uh, transmitters for the TNCs. So we make a list of all those. Plus, uh, if there's electric clusters, that's a load too. So now we take all these things, uh, we add them all together, and then look at what the total solar array output is. Uh, from there, the difference is the, is the uh, is what you have. So here, this. This difference is that these, uh, if there's more power than load, then the then now you're charging the battery. If it is less, you're, you're using so basically you're actually charged. A discharge is required uh, to maintain the bus. So you take this battery uh, uh, discharge, uh, and again you take the losses of uh, the battery discharge controllers. All that power goes into. Um, and then this part is really the battery management part. This is what I need for the discharging. This is how much really battery discharge are in. And this is the kind of thing that we've been doing in the exam. How do I, how do I size the battery? How do I charge and discharge? And, and so on, look at how many amper hours are. And then you look up, find out whether the current that you have, is, is the, is the current required, is there is any current available? If yes, then you decrease. Um, uh, decrease the, uh, uh, the the bus load or increase solar array output. So there are two things I can do. You know, so I can either take reduce the load or increase the load. So, but you want to make sure the you have a balance. If no, then your budget. So basically, you increase this load. Still, the time you basically make sure the required current required is equal to. And same thing here, if, if, if this is the discharge mode, same thing here, if it is uh, here, in this case, it's a charge mode. This is the way, same thing. Again, for the charging, and so we can use the same kind of load, and we figure out what the charges are. But let me, what I can do is, I'll actually walk through some of the examples, and, uh, and then this, this chart becomes used more clearly. So, before we start, let's look at the requirements. First question, what's my load? And what's the load profile? So it could be a straight line, but in this particular case, the load is pretty much like this. So here, uh, with time, there's a minimum, um, is about 17, uh, it looks like 17, 15 uh, watts. And then it, at this time here, it goes up to 17, 22, then goes up to about 17, 38, and it goes up to 1764, comes down. So you see there's a, there's a load profile. Um, uh, uh, so there may be some kind of, maybe a radar operating like that, or a payload, or some kind of sensor demanding a payload like that. So you need to understand that. Now I look at the, so if I plot the same thing on a time scale, this is a, a LEO uh, uh, operation. So here is 
one uh, eclipse, number of eclipse profiles. So here is, is this part is sunlight, and this is an eclipse part. So this is one one uh, orbit and it repeats. So this is an so you can see um, it's doing this in sunlight and eclipse. It comes down. So now I have a load profile mapped up with the uh, uh, with the orbit profile. Uh, now if I look at the sun angle and solar ray output under these conditions, so here is the solar sun, uh, if I take the solar array output to map that uh, with the sun angle under these conditions, I get a power profile. And then for these cases, I want to see, uh, because most of my load is in this area, is providing, here the solar array is providing both the, the load to the uh, uh, power to the load. At the same time, in this part, battery is taking uh, I'm modeling what the battery is doing at this at any given time and seeing how much battery is uh, because you don't, the way you design the space time, you don't want to design the array at the peak power. So what I try to do is design the solar array such that I have an average load and when this peaks, I mean, I take it off the battery. So you can see, when those peaks come in, I'm dipping into the battery. And here in this case, the minimum, uh, the, the, I'm looking at the, I'm plotting this against battery state of charge, or uh, DOD. So you can see the depth of discharge or, uh, is about uh, about six, about 60%. Uh, um, yeah, about, about 60, 65%. And if I have a minimum requirement in the battery, the DOD cannot, so I can now, with this plot, I can see how much I'm uh, uh, coming down the plot. So this, I'm basically, I'm doing it, this kind of analysis is done by um, what we call in industry, or day in the life of. We, we simulate minute by minute or second by second and calculate those numbers, the way the loads are, sunlight eclipses are, so what the solar ray is doing and the battery and you basically simulate that in a, either in Excel format or you can do it in MATLAB or whatever. So it gives you a timeline, but gives you, so this is one of the uh, energy balance analysis chart. Um, excuse me, sir. So did you say that the uh, maximum power load requirement is met by, it's partially met by the solar array and partially met by the battery. Um, can you design the solar array for maximum power? I will use some of the power from the battery, is that what you said? That's correct. <coughs> so in the SLED side, all the load needs to be generated by the battery. So the battery needs to have the maximum peak load in that case. So, okay, go ahead. So, so you're basically designing the battery for the peak load. Yes. So why not design the solar array for the peak, peak load? Because you know, a battery is really Okay, uh, great question. So let me repeat so what people may not have heard. Uh, I, I said earlier that I'm designing the solar array for an average load, and I'm designing the battery for the peak load. Right? And the answer is because the solar array, if I design, if I, if I design the solar array for the peak load, you see there's, uh, there's a lot of time uh, I'm not using the solar array. If you look at this load profile, uh, there's a lot of dead space here. There's no power required. And if, but if I build a solar array for that point, I have a lot of, a lot of, most of the time the solar array power will be shunted. It's not going to blow. So, and batteries are very good at taking peak loads. You've got not long duration. Small peak loads, they can handle. So this is the optimization I was talking about. You first take the solar array, and then, but to keep an eye, as long as your battery DOD doesn't go below. So you, you look at this back solar array and then you say, well, no, let me, I think I can probably take this load on a, uh, on a battery. And then you increase the battery size till, this, till the time you get into an optimum. So the, the best way to start is take an average um, solar, average Taylor power, or average power and start back solar array with that and then move around. In this case, now for example, for a geo bird, where you have say 80, 80 transponders, 70 transponders, 90 transponders, 
those are usually constantly on. Right? The float profile there is not like this basic, it's a straight line. All those loads are on all the time. So then, at that time, you, you design solar array for, for, because the average now has gone up a lot. You want to keep the solar array small. Okay, that's a really big thing. And also, solar array is solar array expensive. Does that help? Yeah. That's why I chose this example because a lot of people are working, working, working in industry, are working on geo environments. And they think all the loads are constant loads. That's not true. Especially this is for Leo. You've got to ask, always demand a load profile for the customer. If not, you make it, you make it your own. You take the data, put the data, uh, uh, and then because by not having a good load profile, you have a very different design. Okay, how do you size? This is something which we have kind of done before, but let's, so I'll go into this one really quickly. Uh, you need to understand, of course, which orbits, which is duration, load, uh, uh, margin, payload, uh, and radiator orientation, um, propulsion system. Is that, is that electric or not? That's a, that's a huge big deal. If it's electric propulsion, usually with electric propulsion, the largest load is the propulsion. Um, and again, some of the uh, mm, some physical constraints. I mean, sometimes we have a body-mounted solar array, so it's limited the way it can operate. Or you can only have maybe have one wing, or two wing, or there will be some constraint in the way the wing is designed. So, or the wing can point. To. So, uh, uh, orbit raising, safe for in these disposal. Orbit raising is when you just drop it from the launch vehicle, spacecraft is now independent, has to go through the destination orbit from LEO to GEO or GTO to, G to GEO or whatever. So that has to be done. So there are, it, it depends on how much power is required during that phase. So that needs to be, and of course, reliability. One thing I have not put in here, which is absolutely critical, is cost and schedule. But that's kind of given. This is always a cost budget. And, uh, Tests were done by a certain time. So sometimes those cost and the schedule constraints drive the whole system design. Um, technology determine, same thing, um, determining the, the load profile, uh, uh, assess the battery energy requirements, the worst case, the cliff case. Charge and uh, uh, sufficient charge rates. Uh, Heaven max rates with overheating by solar rays. Uh, then, then include all the things. So make sure that, uh, we, we do. We, we, they, they account for lunar eclipse, shadowing losses, safe for extra cell failures, extra circuit failures, extra battery cell failures, uh, and then make sure we have margin. Right? There's a DOD requirement. Maximum, you know, how much depletion you can have. Sometimes the requirement, how many cycles you can have of the cell. There's a lot of things that could go in there. So, on the solar array side, whether it's a spinner or three axis or body mounted or one, so or two axis drive or uh, sorry or, or you know, just sometimes you, you're only limited to have one axis uh, control on the uh, you know for, for most of geo world you can get away with one axis uh, solar array time. But if you're flying in LEO, you, you have to have a two axis control of this gimbal. So if not, then it, has, so it poses a lot more problems. So in some hours in time, you end up with some large cosine losses. In the race. So those operation requirements have to be taken into account. The solar cell type is important. Whether it's using a multi-junction cell or a, a silicon or a junction or a whole variety of solar types, different types of solar cells that we have. Again, a lot of them depend on the cost that you can afford. Not only so that, but depending on the missions, what kind of cover plan, how thick, how do we protect this? How do we protect for radiation? How do we protect for atomic oxygen? How do we protect for ESD? It gives a 
lot of different requirements come across. Safety for battery, mass, uh, number of cycle life, you know, charge, discharge profile, power electronics, you know, we talked about, you know, how um, different topology, um, the charging uh, controllers, discharge controllers, uh, this shunt controllers or battery voltage regulators, all those considerations, again, both what you're doing, discharge and charge. So you, for solar arrays, then you end up with, uh, so you start off with the beginning of life condition. So suppose you're launching the system and you, you, launch, you come out of the uh, launch vehicle at a, at a given time in a year, maybe uh, in this year. So for example, here, um, say you launch in June, okay, you end up in June, then the power goes up during autumnal equinox, uh, you get a little bit more power uh, because of the, we look at, we look at the sun, things that we talked about in, in earlier lecture of how the sun inclination changes, intensity varies, changes, there's a little bit more power during that time. But then uh, because of, again, intensity variations during winter, it goes down, then next year, if you come back, it will, this point will, should be the same if everything is okay. But there is an actual degradation that takes place over a period of time, for, over one period, for a variety of reasons, for primarily radiation. Right? There, there radiation causes havoc. Um, so, there's a, so this curve, it sort of becomes sine curve, now it kind of moves down. So again, next time, it moves, this, this comes here, and so on. So now if I expand this for over, say, 15 years, you end up with a solar array profile, something along this line. So this is for a geo mission. I, I start off with a point, in this case, the big VOL power is about 19, say about 19,400 watts. So the solar array that I have are generating 90,400 watts at, when the, at time t equals zero, when I on off, not I come out of, uh, not launch my, reach my geo ta uh, target uh, location, I start generating power, turn on all the uh, transponders, uh, day one, I'm producing about 19.4 kilowatts. But as, as time goes on, uh, it, the power drops to, in the, uh, in the December, uh, in the June, first summer time frame, it goes down to somewhere around almost 16.5 kilowatts. So it's a huge drop, a seasonal drop. Then it goes up again, intensity changes. And here, this is the next point in the same point. So exactly, I think this is a March time frame. So you can see the top, the top part are the March, uh, 31st March, and then these points are 21st September. And these peaks here are, uh, are the 21st June, and these are December 21st. Uh, so, and this 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 degradation that you see down here, let me show you. This part here is your degradation over life for the for the peak power, and this is degradation over life. Um, for the minimum power. So essentially, if I'm designing the solar array or a power system, uh, this is, I have to guarantee, this is the point I need to work, work at. So you do the analysis, and then you do the analysis and show that <clears throat> under all the load conditions, and, and over a period of 15 years, I'm, uh, I'm producing, this is the power I can guarantee. If I, if I design up to this point, that means that I, I've been losing power. I, I will not be able to meet the mission. So this is the this is the design point. The other point is end of life. So this is the end of life summer solstice. When typically when the requirement comes in, yes, this is the end of life summer summer solstice is what we design. This this uh, is not related to any special compressor. Oh yes, it is. It is. It absolutely is. 
because this is end of life. So where is it? Uh, temperature. Okay. Parameter. So the temperature part is because this is an uh, perfect question. Uh, again, for those who have not heard the question, is this related to temperature? The answer is yes, because this is the power analysis done at an operating temperature. In this case, it's geo. So I will have a very good idea. It will be part of the specification of what the what the temperature is going to be at that at that orbit, that inclination. And so we have to perform this analysis at that temperature. So yes. So, so this one we, is given as a special compressor. We can't yes. for a varying compressor. No, uh, it's a, it's a geo, uh, every orbit has a different temperature. So you, so, uh, it's give, usually given in the specification. So this would be around, uh, for geo is going to be around 45 degrees. But that doesn't even say that's during the eclipse or sunlight. Oh, this is, this is sun power. So this is the time. Um, it's exposed to the sun. Right, this is because I'm designing solar array. Yeah. Now, the eclipse part is taken care of because that I also have to provide power to the uh, batteries um, when I'm in eclipse. When, uh, when I'm in sunlight, I'm also charging the batteries. Mm -hmm. So when I'm doing the battery sizing, I'm looking at the eclipse part. Okay? So that's the profile we, 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 we look at. And uh, it's really, it's an over life profile, and I uh, will show you how we can, in fact, what I show you in, uh, in the Excel sheet is just basically taking, all we do is we take this point and that's it, as one point. So that's, all that, that's all that really counts. I need only this number to figure out what the solar array size is all about. So from, if I have this, I can calculate, so I need, I need I need to know what that is, and then from, but I need to design to this point. So I need, to, this is, this is the, this is the VOL design point, and this is, this is EOL requirements. Does EOL start at the time of, the time the spacecraft gets to the orbit, or at space at, it's set at the launch time? Um, can you ask this question? Well, these are all good questions, but. So does this VOL start with the um, time of time in the orbit or start with at the launch time? No, VOL would be the VOL, uh, which is operational VOL, right? So this is the time, beginning of life, on orbit, operational. Okay, so that's what that. Operational compression. Right. So that's what that, uh, that, that's designed for. And this is the end of life. So I'm, I'm, uh, this is my design requirements, but this is how. I'm, but I have to design this much to be able to guarantee this much. And by the way, why is it the um, the solar array power is too low? It's kind of minimum at twenty percent to twenty. It's the summer solstice, right? Yes, summer solstice. Should be max. No, but if you remember, go back to the uh, uh, previous lectures, because the temperature goes goes up. Also. I mean, temperature oh, right. goes up. The voltage drops, right. temperature is pretty bad for the, so, and there's a variety of reasons, so you can see, that's, that's why this is temperature effect. Uh, uh, this wild switch string is also largely because of temperature and sun intensity. But this, this degradation is radiation. This oscillation is because temperatures and, and, and so on. Same thing that I showed way back in, I think, uh, third or fourth lecture. So when I'm calculating, I'm taking into account all those factors, and I'll show you in a minute what those things, what, how those things are. But, it's, but you end up with this kind of uh, profile. Mm -hmm. um, so this, these are called seasonal variations. Okay. Again, you have aphelion, which is furthest point in the sun, perihelion closest to the sun, and uh, and then all. These changes, seasonal, temperature, uh, a lot of things. And then this the overall degradation is primarily because of radiation and some other system losses. You know, contamination loss and so on. There's some over degradation that happens for a period of time. So 
spring equinox is the best time to power the spacecraft. Right? Well, that is, but if you design for that, you only you will be mistaken because you will not get that much power when you need it. This is you, you can only guarantee. You to guarantee this is what you can guarantee. Anything above is extra. Mm -hmm. So you said that degradation is due to radiation. What about primarily radiation or primarily radiation? What about during the solar minimum and solar maximum? How does that affect? Okay, the radiation? good. So uh, what we do. Uh, uh, so there are different types of radiation. One is this constant background radiation and environment. And then what we do is, is a solar max that happens. Uh, so what, I, what we do typically is you, uh, actually for, we, we, we have to account for those. In fact, I'll have a chart later on to show all the factors that are used to calculate this degradation. And how do we use the solar max? And how many cycles of solar max radiation that we use? And that, that affects the total dose and that also is part of that. You have to factor that. So normally, as I said earlier, the solar max uh, appears every in every eleventh year. It's a nice, you know, it's very periodic. It really happens every eleventh year. So guess what? If I've designed for a fifteen-year mission, I have to account for at least two of those events to be safe. So here is an example. Of actually, this is actually uh, 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 one of the analysis that I, I do. I plugged in the actual numbers. This is a particular case uh, that I've run through. In this case, you know, this is so I end up with a lot of these things. I build these uh, Excel models and, and actually for a variety of things. And there are a lot of degradation factors that are that is in line in that I'm showing. This is an actual. Now, the question is, you, you have to design, you have to design to be guaranteed to be able to provide this kind of power at the end of 15 years. Right? But I don't have data. All I have is beginning of life. When I build the array, I'm building a ground temp room, room temperature, and I'm testing it under, under simulated light condition, I don't have radiation. So I have to have a very, very good model to be able to predict that. And, and that's where, so, and in this, this part of budget analysis that you, is really building that model, taking all the factors, the degradation factors, into account. So uh, temperatures, radiation, atomic oxygen uh, uh, effects, um, ESD effects, color glass effects, color glass darkening, there are a lot of Adhesives there, adhesives go out, they, they evaporate, they, there's a, they go, come, come back in color glass, they reduce the illumination. So that, so there are a variety of factors, each one of them we have, we put a lot of test data and on orbit data, and we tune those parameters to be able to predict these numbers really. And because if, at the same time, if I have too much margin in my calculation, guess what? Either I'm going to be under that number or over that number. If I'm over that number, end of life, it means this will be much higher, which means I'm over designing. I, and at the same time, I can't afford to be under that number because I have to guarantee that power. So the, the tuning and, and the, the, two, the tools, the analysis, this analysis package is very complex. And, um, it takes a lot of runs and so on. I've just been doing a mission for, for, for Jupiter for many, many years and uh, looking at some of the data that we provided to them was unbelievable. After so many years, we are absolutely spot on what we predicted and what we're getting on orbit is perfect. Nice, nice to see. Which means these models are very, very well tuned. So, prediction accuracy, right? So, during proposal phase, um, when you're putting a proposal together and customers say, I want this much power, uh, we have to then generate these, uh, a paper cell solar array prediction. Right? You need to do this all on paper. Um, uh, paper cell predicts are really based on spec solar cell parameters. So I have all these spec parameters, uh, 
all these numbers that are provided, as we're look at that and use a, a generate a, a analysis which can predict that with the cost. And then this is during the proposal phase. Now when I go into for uh, when you start designing, we say okay, this is how much this. Based on my end system requirement, I work it work backwards to say this is how much I need beginning to end. So the way this whole analysis program would work is you always start, as I said earlier, you always start with your end of life requirement. In fact, in this solar array, you need to get end of life sum of souls. Then you work backwards from there to say beginning of life uh, number, and uh, and this is at op you know at at, uh, at operational temperature. But then when you're building hardware, you don't have operational temperature. This could be 70 degrees, 80 degrees. If you're building, you're building on ground. All the spec numbers are at 28 degrees C. So from here. I need to design and, and figure out what the beginning of life uh, at uh, room temperature, 28 degrees C. Number one. So this is how I design. This is what I built solar arrays. This is how I built my solar arrays. Based on that. But it has to. So I start with here, analyze the price of this temperature. Here it is end of life, which beginning of life means no degradation, right? So this full degradation. So you have, you have a degradation model, you have to have temperature model, so the environmental model, everything I talked about on the right hand side. All plus my load may vary. My there's an aging effect on the battery. There's an aging effect on this thing. Plus they may things we have. Um, this may require two circuits fail. But I have to bring everything up front. Yeah. So all the reliability requirements, which are not, we have to take the worst case. This is the worst case. And you end up with the viewer's best case. Right? With all reliability, all solar cells, all batteries in here. So that is the problem. That's the way we, we work out. And then once we do this, if your predictions are correct, once you do this, you know when you go into orbit at operation temperature, it'll be right. And then your prediction is by the time this will, will come up. But at, at this point, all, all I have is a best guess. Okay? So that's what that's what the whole so uh, in proposal phase we do a fifth predict. When you start for production, we are actually at this point. Then after solar solar array is manufactured. What we do is what is called a post bond solar array prediction. So that means we laid all the cells out, we do everything, and then what we do is we, we do a lab step. So we, we take the solar array, uh, we, we, uh, and then we shine. There's a, a special simulator which is like uh, it shines, uh, which is basically a sun simulator. You light on that, and you build IV curve. So I have an IV curve on every circuit. But before we build an IV curve circuit, I have an IV curve for every cell. And then we match each and every IV uh, cell to make sure that uh, I have a, a nice optimized curve. That's what we do, and then we finally build the whole panel, we flash it, and we record IV curve of each and every circuit. That will give me a condition where it says, okay, now I've built it, I'm ready to ship it to the manufacturer, the space craft guys, now I have a very good model and, and I know exactly how much it's going to produce because I have an IV curve. So this is what the post born predict number is. That means it's showing, this is where I'm starting off. Okay? So you, when you hear the term post born predict, that's exactly what it is. And then you end up with an on orbit uh, performance. And also here, you want this one, this one to be with no margin. And you want to make sure that you actually, you, ideally you want margin to be, to be zero at this point. Here you want full margin. Because you want to make sure 
But you want, at the end of the day, you want this margin to go down to zero. You don't want to give extra power. All right. Then uh, you also have the space coverage in different shapes. As you move around, you have shadows happening. And when we talk about in the solar ray design, when you have a shadow, uh, and this is an unshaded cell, you have a shader, partially shaded, and shaded. So the power will change. So if, 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 you have, if I'm putting this together and there's a shadow here of the, of, of the space car, and I'm losing power. I'm, I may think, okay, I've got all these panels or producing power, but guess what? And again, to, do the, to understand what the shadow is, you really have to model the space car and do a simulation and move it around and predict, calculate exactly how much, what area is being shadowed and how much it is. And how much margin should I allow for the, for the shadow? Because that, if the shadow loss comes in, I'm, guess what? I'm starving the payload of the power. So you've got to allow for the shadow loss. And, uh, and we do pretty complicated geometric, geometrical analysis to see because of the antennas and all kinds of things that come around the space car as you move around, how much, what part of the solar array is shadowed? And you factor it in, again, back in here. The shadowing loss has to go quite a bit. So yeah, so some of the examples here, I mean, uh, here is just a couple of examples of these antennas moving across. So here, I know, well, there's a shadow on this wing up here. And in this case also, so we do all kinds of really complex geometrical analysis to figure out as the thing rotates, move around, how much, what part of these, these arrays are uh, shadowed and by how much. Then margin. So, uh, as I said, you have power generation sources, both solar rays, batteries, and so on, and electrical load. And the whole idea is to make sure these things are exactly right. So, so if I look at if I look at this part, and if I keep margins here, that becomes that's called a source margin. For example, my solar array has to be designed ideally to meet my need. I need 18 kilowatts, but I get I want to be 200 watts. Uh, if I say, uh, the requirement may say, I, I, I want 5% extra margin. That's a source margin. Or I want one cell failure, or one have to have extra capacity in the back margin. That's a source margin. Then you have, or else you may have load margin. This thing that I have, this payload I requires uh, 2 kilowatts, 2.2 kilowatts. But you know what, I'm, I want to be, I'm not sure, sure it might be 2.2. So I'm keeping an extra 100 watts extra as my load margin. And so uh, the, the margins are kept on both sides. And it's really important to understand how much, who is keeping the margin. Again, as a chief engineer or a systems engineer, you need to make sure you're not keeping margin on here. For example, you may have a uh, actually, it gets even worse. You, for example, you're designing communication systems. And um, you're designing an antenna or a transponder, and you have a 3 dB margin on that. So you have already got times two margin. And what you have, you want to be a little careful, so I want 2 dB, I want 3 dB. So you've kept your margin. Now with that drives a power conversion. So now, have, now I've got margin upon margin, and I've put margin on top, so I've got a lot of load margins. Now I'm putting, a, things in the source side, 
say, oh, well, this is the now total load, forgetting how much margin they have kept, and now you put margin on top to source that. So sometimes it's very easy to have margin upon margin and adds up a lot. And all, ideally, when you finally up there, you want margin to be zero because the margin is X at the end of the way. So the trick is, how do I, how do I keep it right? What you have to understand is that is who's keeping the margin there. For example, I have a heater load. I'm not too sure whether I need 100 watts for the heater. But I'll tell the power guys, okay, I need 120 watts. So I'm just want to keep it safe. I've got 20 watts margin there. It happens all the time. Everybody wants to keep the margin so they feel safe. So the load margin is really uh, for a fixed solar array, the battery half. Load margin is load capacity minus required load. What the total capacity is, what minus what the excess the margin is. And should be able to, to add the load margin to the load and still have the budget float. And vice versa. The source margin is for a fixed load, uh, of, 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 of a load power requirement, the amount of allowable uh, uh, allowable uh, decrease is the solar rate output. The source margin is predicted solar rate output minus solar rate So, how is power budget calculated? So, here is the power budget. Here it is. You, you find here you have zero uh, calculated, which says that you have zero excess power. Once that happens, this now, but total array, solar array predict that I have, if I take that into account, this difference is the source, the source margin. <coughs> now, as I said, if you look at a typical uh, program cycle, you know, these solar arrays, these satellite programs are complex. They last three typical satellite, you know, uh, a standard geocommunication satellite take about three years from complex from a from time you get a requirement to, to build. But if for old complex spacecraft, for example, I mean James Webb telescope has been built for God knows how many years. Still not that. Still not even long ways off. Take five, ten years in that. You have to you know. So they will go over a very long period of time. And these are all different requirements, you know, this is the pre-concept, this is the concept phase, then there's a concept development phase, then you finally come up with this concept and you have an approval, say, okay, now you start designing because sometimes these, even this takes three, four years. And uh, then once you're done, you do a preliminary design uh, phase and system assembly and, and then this is the operation sustainment. So this program can last, as I said, good two to <coughs> up to three years. And again, as you design, as the design matures, you start with a cursory level, <coughs> and then you start narrowing it down. So your margins keep moving down, and you at any given time in this phase, you need to figure out how much it is, and the better you have, better control you have, the margin is better. So this is a Then the margins are also required by uh, but uncertain. Margin, margin is really, 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 really are not certain about things you keep margin. So I can't know exactly it's going to be 50 watts or 500 watts or uh, 2.5 kilowatts. I don't need to keep margin because I know exactly and I, if I'm generating it. It's always the uncertain. Now, um, the other thing that we're looking at is the technology. You may have, because these, these these things are so complex. There's so much technology in this. So there's a way to measure and gauge what the maturity level of these technologies are. And we call this uh, TRL. TRL uh, is a normal terminology that's used in industry. And the TRL scale goes from, from, from really from, uh, from one to nine. TRL-9 is something which is already is flying in orbit. We have on-orbit data, and it's got heritage, so I know exactly how much that comes. But if I have, a, if I now bring a payload, saying, okay, it's only TRL-2, and I'm saying, give me 
uh, that will require 283.5 watts. But I'm saying, well, wait a second, what's the GRL level? Oh, it's only three. Which means you're up here, which means that this is really pretty low maturity level. How can I be so sure that when you bring it to the final maturity, you will get that exact number? So what I do is, not only with the phase of the program, but the maturity of the particular technology. If I'm taking the reaction rate, which is new, I don't know what these are. These are maybe, I can't guarantee, depending on I look at the maturity level of each of those items, and assign margin accordingly. So for high TRL numbers for items, you can reduce the food margin. For low TRL, you won't increase, because you just don't know, finally, when they're all done, what the numbers. Is there any fraction of reliability assigned to all of these different levels? <coughs> you know, like a tolerance in your um, margin design? Can you repeat that? I was just asking, is there any um, uh, uncertainty level in these different levels? Absolutely. This is really uncertainty level. So maturity, you can take it the other way up. Readiness is really a uh, converse of uncertainty. The, the more the higher you are, the more certain you are, because you already built it, it's flying, I've got a hardware, it's already flying, it's zero the number, it's, so it's, it's, very, it's very certain. So, um, but, so it's very low risk. As I go down, that's why I put in the red thing, as you go down and become redder and redder, the lower the TRL, the more risky it is. Which means you need more margin. And again, for, for most, for most spacecrafts, you wouldn't even consider putting anything in a spacecraft unless you've demonstrated TRL-6. TRL-6 is the point where you, which means I've demonstrated technology, TRL, uh, which means it's demonstrated system and subsystem models or prototype demonstration in the relevant environment. I have to demonstrate that. That's where, for example, I have taken the hardware, the relevant environments, if it is space vacuum, but I have to run it under thermal vacuum conditions. Run all thermal cycles of it. Uh, shake it the way at least, so, uh, so I have, I have shown the, uh, the mechanical environment, the electrical environment. Um, I've also got ESD, EMI environment, all the EMI tests that I was talking about last time, show that it works. Also, um, the thermal cycle, if you're seeing uh, 500 thermal cycles of from here and here, or 10,000 thermal cycles. Or, so, below TRL-6, we will, most spacecraft will not even consider putting in there. That's why these, and these are very well standardized um, processes, uh, uh, technology, uh, gauges that are used across the industry to make sure we all understand. They're across the government labs as well, or is it just about? So, um, all, uh, practically everywhere. I mean, but the thing is, these scales have come up with, and again, this one is, I've taken this from NASA Engineering Handbook, so this is a NASA scale. There's an equivalent, but pretty much the same DOD standard. But they all, I mean, we, 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 we always talk about TR levels in, in industry, uh, and it doesn't matter what and if somebody, if I look at it, uh, if I understand what TRL 3 or 4, everybody will in the industry know approximately where, where it's going to be. Now when I say TRL 6, I'm assuming, somebody says it's TRL 6, that means it has already demonstrated, I can ask for a report where it is shown that it's actually done all the analysis, all the testing in the relevant environment. And I can show, do a full report to show that. I can't just make a, ah, it's TRL-6, or TRL-4, or TRL-7, or TRL-9. TRL-9, you know, I can only claim when I'm actually on orbit, actually TRL, in some cases, we say, not only on orbit, but it has to complete end of life. You know, uh, some, some people take the extreme, but some, at least you have to reach on orbit and on orbit conditions, and then make sure, before you can claim, claim that. And here are some more, details of, you know, each of those TRL levels and, and you know, uh, but I, again, in the notes, 
this is an important thing. You, you can you'll hear the word TRL all the time. But, um, but I guess um, TRLs and um, margin design they can't give you a guarantee in terms of you know uh, functioning different you know no. subsystems. Like for example, if you have a deployable mesh antenna and yeah. you're going to you're going to send a comment to deploy your antenna and you know the antenna mechanism doesn't work. So what do you want to do with TRLs or you know, well, no no design? okay so let's take that example. So if you have a deployable mesh antenna, okay, um, if it doesn't work, that is not an acceptable answer in, the, in our industry. It might happen. I mean, you yeah, but so what we need to do. Of time, but there is a so what we need to do is, I agree, so it may happen. Now, what you want to do is, it may happen, that means it's lower TRL. So what we need to do is demonstrate and do enough testing. We need to do testing, we do you know, so many deployments. But since it's going to deploy in space environment, you've got to deploy in space environment. So simulate on, create a giant vacuum chamber under that, that particular thermal condition and deploy several times. Also under worst case conditions, you may have certain friction, you may have, you may have. So all those things in those deployment tests are done in such complex testing. Right? It's unbelievable. So there are, there are few, like, uh, I mean, not few, many, like, Yes. Cases, yes. So, so we have got to do, we do a very detailed fault analysis. We do a what is called an FMEA, failure mode effect analysis. We understand. We look at every possible failure mode that can ever happen at every level. Simulate that and test it. Especially areas where there's a single point failure. Like if an antenna doesn't deploy, the whole mission is gone. If a solar array doesn't deploy, the spacecraft is dead. But if out of 80 transponders, 60 work, the mission is not gone. So things like, or, or the structure fails, the single point. So when there are single point failures, we have to do an incredible amount of tests to make sure that those are not there. So uh, could fail is not an option, in our case, because those missions are 500 million, sometimes a billion to dollars missions. And it takes years to build. So that's why the, I keep saying, the testing, Particularly testing in space environment is the most expensive part of any space project. How much is usually the ballpark cost of the hardware in such missions? Because hardware, it's the program cycle which is costly. Yes. But the hardware is like 20% of the cost of the whole program cycle. Because you can always, you know, <coughs> let's say it's a launch malfunction. You need to put up a new satellite in, let's say, one year. And they usually do that. Right. A program takes 15 years to develop, launch malfunction. And the newer one comes in two or three years time again, the new hardware. Okay, so let me repeat the question for people on the net. Question is, what's, what percentage of the total cost is actual hardware, right? Yeah. Uh, it depends, it depends. And, uh, but it is not the most important, not the biggest part. Biggest part. Uh, the biggest part is, of course, the duration. You know, the, the sub, it takes, these facilities are very, very complex. Uh, the testing facilities cost billions of dollars, literally, not without exaggeration, billions of dollars. So that that facility, the people, it takes, uh, uh, you, you need an army of people to build these things. So the, the engineering, especially the non-recurring engineering, right. is enormous. So the hardware itself is, I would say, I mean, literally, uh, once it's all done, if you take the manpower out, it's probably uh, no more than 20%. Yeah. No more than, I thought even for that might be 15, 20 that uh, that would be the material cost. cost right. So if you look at the material cost of the project, it's the it's the building and the testing cost. It's very very high. So an example here. Here is the example in solar array predict. Worst case condition is the power estimated that I need is say 1200 or 12 or 12 kilowatts. So if I error. So first of all, there could be a prediction error. When I'm calculating everything, all my analysis, there could be an error in my prediction. Because my all my tune, all my parameters aren't exactly right. There may be some things which have not got all the coefficients may not be exact. So they're usually two to three percent. Say example, in this case, say if my prediction error is three percent. That is three hundred and sixty watts. Is it coming from the systematic error or human error? It could be a variety of reasons. I mean, so for example, here is my 
this is how much I need, but there is a prediction error, like like a measurement error. I have I'm measuring this temperature of this box, and I see temperatures 15 degrees, but then the sensor that I'm measuring has an error. Just like so, when I'm analyzing, there's an error because of the is that numerically things because I then, you know the parameters that I use, the coefficients that I use are not exactly right. I may be using a beginning of flight number, they will be an aging of flight, uh, which I have not accounted for. So, you know, I, I'm, in this example, assume that it's 3%. Then, now, then there is something called a contract margin. So the customer would say in this case, hey, when you build these things, please make sure I want a 5% margin on this whole array. I want 5% extra. That's a contract margin. So in this case, if it's 5%, this comes up to 680 watts. But then on top of that, this is what I have to get. I have to get me this is a requirement. I have to provide that margin to the customer end of life. But I have to be sure by the time I deliver it, I need to have some margin. That's where I put my design margin. And this design margin starts varying. I start off with, say, 20% right at the beginning, and I'm doing this rough. Before you build the hardware, just uh, uh, you know, because there's so many unknowns, so many things at low TR, I don't even know where they are. Still, they're from. So I start out with 20% margin. At 15, 15% say maybe at PDR. At 8% then I come up with the at the CDR, and 5% at MRR is the oh, okay. Well these these things are uh, CDR is the uh, so ATP is authority to proceed. That's when your contract starts. PDR is and you come up with the system, do preliminary analysis, preliminary design, you build some hardware, you end up, so now I can reduce that to 15%, because now my maturity level goes up. As I go up, up the scale, I can reduce the margin. Then, when I've done, CDR is critical design review. That's when, by the time I do a critical design review, I have all the detailed drawings done, finalized drawings, you know, for final assembly, I've built actual hardware, I've qualified it all past TR, I've checked. I've actually built hardware, tested it under all conditions. So now I know pretty much, so I can say I can make 8%. Again, these are just my guesses. It doesn't have to be. And then MRR is manufacturer and industry review. I've done everything. Now before I can say, okay, start building the final flight hardware, there's another review that we have it's called MRR. And then when you finally build hardware, at post bond, I need to have about 2% margin. So to be sure that I, and, and I don't have problems or not. Um, so you see my margins are, are kind of decreasing. So if I stack up these numbers, and again, these numbers are just, these don't take this as hard, this is not normal. This is just representative, saying, all I want to show is the convergence of this. And you have to be Depends on the mission, depends on how you're doing. You, uh, you know, you have the judgment call as to how, how I do this. But I, I want to be at least, I, I want to end up at least 2% at post bond to make sure that there's, there's no problem. So if I, I can stack this, this is how much I require for the space mission. There's a prediction error margin. I can't give that away. Contract margin. So here's what I need, and this is my design margin. So I have to start here to so guarantee this showing how the margins kind of stack. So the um, the design margin does not account for the contract margin. So when you come down to so, the... So, uh, yes and no. That's why I showed it here. This, uh, just so you would, you may say, well, design margin should go above contract margin. Yeah. But sometimes it can go either way. Again, this is something which it depends. You have to negotiate with the customer. Hey, do you really want me to take into account, or do you want this over and above my design margin? That's why I showed it here. And a lot of these things you have to go back to your customers and ask and clarify. And they say, no, I want to make sure I need de guaranteed design margin. That means I just think we'll go on top of that. But then there's again, see the margin upon margin goes up. What does the ATP stand for? ATP, okay, ATP is authority to proceed. So the first, you've got the contract, before the 
So you have done all your analysis, and you put a, the customer says, okay, now here's a rep uh, request for proposal, they ask for proposal, you submit a proposal, and these, th times take, these things take months and months. Finally, we give a proposal, which is usually a ton of documents and all the analysis, we negotiate pricing, six months, finally we get a contract, so, okay, now you're ready to start. That's, how, that's when I start opening a program, open a different contract, start. That is a key, there's a key milestone for authority to proceed. And now authorized to start charging that program. That's when the clock starts. So these are big gates. Authority to proceed, then there's another gate that comes in immediately after that is, after ATP, typically within a month or two months, or three months, depending on the size of the program, there's another big gate called SRR, which is Systems Requirements Review. What we do is we look at all requirements, but then the whole team comes up, picks up, and then each subsystem looks at all the details and look at all the requirements once again in detail, in detail. From the design requirements, test requirements, analysis requirements, and then we have a requirements review, SRR, which shows, okay, we have the customers in the room. Again, these are usually pretty large rooms. There's a lot of customers. You know, a customer brings the entire team, which is 50, 60, sometimes 100 people. And then you, you, you go back, and sometimes these SRRs are days. They last for a few days. You go through each system in detail. Say, okay, this is what I, Mr. Customer, I've understood that you're required. Is this correct? And we say, once you pass that, Usually, the documents are not, oh, this is not what I meant in my document. Uh, what I meant is this. So before we start doing the detailed design, we have a review, which, which is SRR. We, we then we come up with a clear definition. Customer knows what, this is how I, I understood as a designer, this is how I'm going to go build it. So, so anyway, those are, there are a lot of uh, these cases. So what are those percentages applying to? Oh. Because it adds up to 50% so far. No, 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 no. You don't, this one doesn't, you don't add it, no. I'm saying at this ATP, I, let's say I put 20% margin. Again, I mean, maybe this is too high. Maybe at, at ATP I can maybe put 10% because of a lot of uncertainty. I roughly, I take back of the envelope design, roughly like, I don't do a full time of life, just do an Excel, very quick estimate. So I put a margin on top. As I, as I go through, I reduce the margin. It's not, this is not additive. So it's just a, a percentage of the margin. So here, you know, me, what I'm saying is at ATP hold a bigger margin and reduce the margin as you go down. So that's basically 20% of the predicted error margin plus the yeah, yeah, total, total margin. Total margin. Total margin. Yeah. Yeah. Again, maybe 20% is too high. It's too, maybe right. 10%. So, but the point is, you see, it's decreasing. And, and again, depending on, if I have a, if, I, if I'm designing a geo bird, I know pretty much I'm not going to keep this in mind. But if I'm building a James Webb Space Telescope, no idea how to do it. Haven't dealt with it. Nobody's ever done anything like this. A lot of unknowns. Huge unknowns. Or putting a, a mission to, to Europa, right? Solar mission to Europe or Saturn. You don't even know what radiation is going on. You don't even know what. There's so many unknowns. You don't know how the solar system is. You don't know how the temperature is. You don't know. So you put margin. And you, as you go analysis, you put the data. So, uh, by the way, uh, was there any occurrences where the design team decided to increase the uh, design margin? Yes, all the time. Before the launch or something like that. You mean the design is very, very yeah. under. Like for example, I mean, I, I, I did the Europa mission, Jupiter, the nuclear mission to Jupiter. We started off at 33 percent. Beginning. Before because it was built, right? Before it was before we start yeah, at this point. Yeah, yeah, because because there were so many unknowns. All subsystems are not designed. I, how do I know what the, the TC? Uh, thermal control one. How do I know what the payload is? Payload may change. So that's depending on how immature, how low down the GRL is, or 
how how let's do how ill defined your system is to more margin. You're talking about the clipper? Uh, no, clipper is uh, Europa clipper is not is being designed now. Yes, right. This is this is the one I was working on for GMO program, uh, which was a nuclear mission that's done about 15, 15 years ago. But yes. Clipper would have the same issue. But Clipper we know better because we've flown a mission to yes, to Juno, mm -hmm. uh, Juno mission, which is a nuclear, which is a solar mission. So I now have very very good predicted data, and, and actually on orbit data. So I don't need test margins because I know that margin very very well. So uh, Juno, this flu, Juno. Juno is already on on space. Uh, okay. But Clipper is in plan right In now. plan right now. Then there's, we're also building plans for, for missions to Trojan asteroids, which is 5.2 AU. Oh. Um, a lot of fun missions, and a lot of these science missions, we're doing, we're going to uncharted territories. So, uh, what is uh, per year max AU we can go about these, uh, in current times, 15 AUs per year? Or? Uh, Wow, that's a tough question. Your question is, how? what's the max AU, AU you can go per year? It all depends on your propulsion system. But like, yeah, that's the max I'm like... Well, I don't know. I mean, if you if you use a chemical propulsion, but you don't have a chemical propulsion system which can take you to 15 AU per year. Right. Uh, maybe you do, but, but with the ESG is a heck of a giant problem. <laughs> uh, a chemical propulsion. You can't, certainly you cannot do it with electric. Right. So electric stuff is too long. For five AU, for electrical, it may take about seven, eight years. Seven, eight years. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Same thing applies for the battery. Right? You know, the battery. And in this case, battery case, your margin is really in terms of DOD. Right? Because you have, your DOD is your margin. You want to make sure you don't go deplete so much. So you, you know, for, you know, in this case, it's still okay. You have number of cell failures for liability and maximum uh, depth allowed or depth of discharge shows how much the battery can can handle 100%, but I don't want to go there because I need some margin. So and for lithium ion batteries, typically we don't allow the maximum DOD is about 60, 60%. For geo, for Leo, you don't go down because we don't the uncertainty is too high. We don't even go to about 35%, 40% max. So that's your control margins there. Then you have operational modes, right? So for, we've got to do a power analysis for each of these cases. Ground test integration as a separate requirement. Launch operation as a separate, separate, separate set of requirements. Spinning transfer orbit. And then when the antennas are deployed, so there's a separate requirement. Because there are loads happening. See, spacecraft is doing something. And at all times, you have to have generation must match the load. And insertion into the right orbits. Then in normal operations, you are either in sunlight, eclipse, or your station keeping. Where your thrusters are on. Right. If it's electric station keeping, I'm, I'm operating all my loads, charging the battery, at the same time I'm doing orbit raising for the station keeping. And then contingency operations. Um, and of course, just to remind you, there are many different orbits. It is not just, you know, this could be Leo, Mio, it could be high elliptical, Geo. Not only that, you can have these some fairly complex uh, uh, orbits which go through. Again, this is showing on Earth, but you can have some orbit like this across Moon, across Mars, or across some, you know, so it's all over the place. Um, and of course, not only that, we have, as I said earlier, Orbit period is changing, eclipse period is changing, aspect is changing, so a lot of things are changing all times. So it's typical, uh, so here is a spacecraft come, taking off from here, from ground, goes into launch vehicle, and comes up. So there are several things that happen when you when you come up. So just showing you the typical sequence of operations right? when you when you launch from a from Launcher, you, it, depending on what launch vehicle, whether it's the Falcon, whether it's Delta, whether it's an Atlas, whether it's an Ariane spacecraft, or, or, or any other launcher, they all launch depending whether you're launching from Cape or, or Wallops, uh, uh, or in Kuro in, in French Guyana, or in uh, Western uh, United States, and uh, okay, whether in, uh, you're launching from. Uh, uh, um, uh, Vandenberg or um, you know, Kazakhstan or depending
depending on what launch vehicle which you use and what not, they all ending up in a different location. But basically, you drop it, the launch vehicle takes you into a certain orbit, and you drop it. And you stay. And that's the and then the space craft takes over. And the typical sequence of operations is first point here, you separate from this launch vehicle, and typically what you do is you start spinning. And you start spinning for a variety of reasons, because if you don't, then you, then you end up with one part in sun, the other part in eclipse, which means one part will be hot, the other will be this, you have a huge temperature difference. But if I start rotating it slowly in the barbecue mode, I, I make the spacecraft thermally stable, which is a huge deal. So, uh, because of thermal time, so you just spin it at a low frequency, just to make sure it is, you, you, it's called barbecue mode, you, you just keep spinning. Also, it gives you better control. It also help, help, should help towards the shadowing effects. It helps, yeah, because this is, this is a sh so the shadowing, shadowing is effect. If you do, otherwise, if you have too much temperature differential, we also have a ESD issue, we saw. So keeping it in a barbecue mode, in a thermally stable environment, helps a lot of things. So typically what you do is you drop it in, launch vehicle drops it, and then it starts rotating. So you start, and then you come in, you keep rotating that, come back, and then you, you end up in this, in this orbit, in a circular orbit, or whatever the orbit is. Now you want to change the location. So here is when you do, you do a, your perigee bus. You fire a rocket because you want to go to a different orbit. Okay, for example, in Leo, you want to end up in Geo. So here you fire a rocket, you end up in here. You again you do, and then the perigee bus. So you circularize the orbit. So this is your home and transport. And now you do another orbit to circularize the orbit. So here we come in, and we end up in, in now in Geo. So basically, the chemical thrusters, from Leo, you, you do a home and transfer to Geo, and then you fire another thruster, and then. So by this time, when you do this thrust, thrust mechanism, this thrust, your propulsion system is down. That's all it is doing. You see, the chemical system is down. So the barbecue mode wouldn't require two antennas all the time if you need a point, you know, if you need a communication or telemetry on all the time? Okay, so the uh, question is, if I'm barbecue mode, then do I need two antennas all the time? No, not really. Depends uh, how you place your antenna, if you, and, and how you which which barbecue mode. If you're doing this barbecue like this, and your antenna is this, so you can you can point antenna. So it's always so you've got to point the antenna in such a way that you always uh, need a basic, and it's easy to do that. And again, the type of antenna you have, you need an S band. You don't, you can't be too restricted because you want you, know, you want global, you want very wide coverage. You select the antenna. So now you come in, now it's coming in. Then, now we start, again, uh, at this point, you reorient uh, to aperture burn attitude. Um, I think this is number, number four, this is number three, this is number four, and you do an aperture burn again, and again, now you spin down to about five RPM as you go, because you put it out, you start again slowing down a little bit. Then you, re again, at this point here, you reorient and deploy it. Now you have done everything. Now you again you you, you reorient the spacecraft. So you, now you're ready to deploy the the solar array. So again, now you again slow down the, because you, you can't spend too fast and deploy the array because you're putting too much load onto that. Again, you slow down. You go down to about about one and a half RPM, about. And then you first deploy some of the reflectors because you want to establish communication with a limited load. Um, then you spin with that ref ref the reflectors, and you actually, actually sometimes you use the spin to, to force your reflectors coming out. And you, you use the spin to also help facilitate your deployment. But as you as more, the more you deploy, you finally you down, down to about 0.33 RPM. Again, slow mode. Now you deploy, deploy first the north, uh, uh, solar array and then the south or sometimes you do, you normally do one array at a time. So, and then finally you end up in this configuration which is this. The, now at that time you have omni employment and you now you can start in your basic operation. So under all these phases, the reason I'm showing is there's a power budget. Again, you can see solar arrays are deployed partly, 
bad things are done. So there are different operation modes in each one of them, different load configurations, and you have to understand exactly what is on and how much, what the power budget situation is. And you do, um, you do analysis, you do analysis for all of those places. And then once you're on orbit, this chart I've shown before, really it does that this time, it's the same thing for years, really going into the, in, in for example, in this case of geo, if now you have 24 hour, hour, hour orbit, the worst case eclipse is 1.2 hours, 72 minutes, and you have this cycle, you keep doing it for years and years and years. <coughs> oh. Sometimes when you need to be pointed towards the sun all the time. Yeah, go ahead. So let's say, uh, I'll give it by an example here. Let's say if this is the sun pointing direction and you want to be always pointed towards the sun yeah. like this and you're rotating. So when this is in the shadow direction, it faces on the other side. Yes. But a lot of missions have a requirement that one side should always be sun facing. Yeah. So you have, you, that's where you are. That's why. That's where you have your uh, rays uh -huh. on a gimbal. So yeah, it's gimbling. Okay. So they're always gimbling. Oh. So, so you need sometimes a propulsion system to correct gimbling or fine tune it all the time, or is it? No, I mean, the thing is uh, not really that much because, um, fortunately, because of uh, if they're slightly off pointed, uh -huh. the maximum you're going to have is you have a little bit of cosine loss. Uh, but cosine. Right. Of uh, cosine loss, you know, is um, cosine of you know 90 degrees versus uh, 80, 88 degrees or seven, uh, um, uh, 88 degrees or 92 degrees. It's not much of a difference. So in fact, even around here, plus minus, it's hardly a difference. If you overlook it, look at the cosine. So cosine loss is, by, in other words, a very tolerant system. I guess. So the, how do so you? You don't need to be very accurate. You don't, don't need to be exactly. It's if a you do, mechanism? sorry. How do you gimbal? It's a pre wheel mechanism, like you're hanging onto something which is completely. No. So, so it's, it's a. Uh, uh, okay, here. So here, there's a gimbal. So this thing rotates in this direction. Oh, okay. And it's controlled. The spacecraft computer. We are measuring the sun. We're measuring the power of this, actually use the solar array as a sun sensor, and saying, because you, you're looking at the peak point, and you're always making sure the sun, the solar array is a normal sun, and it goes back, the measurement goes back to the spacecraft computer, the spacecraft computer turns the gimbals, provides some, so there's a, there's, a, there's a mechanism around here, things like that. In this case, it is only one axis tracking. Right. But if I'm doing, if I have this particular thing, which is very awkward, and it has to point in a certain direction, I can't turn the spacecraft, then I have to have two axis tracking. So if you look at the space station, space station is two axis tracking. Mm -hmm. Because you have, essentially you have a, uh, you know, uh, let's say this is, uh, how do I show this? Let's say this is the main thrust of the space station. Right. Right? So there's a gimbal which, which turns it this way, and there's also a gimbal which turns it this way. So I, now I can, the right, space station can, so this can, there's always a native facing because that's, and it's doing all these things, but now if I'm doing two axis control, I can have articulating system. This can always point to the sun, and this, this these other things are pointing to the sun. Most, in, in LEO, you, you generally end up in two axis tracking because you're constrained. In GEO, you're, you're far away. Oh, right. And in other axis, it's tip, you're rotating at about four degrees of, uh, an hour very slow, but sometimes you, for seasonal correction, it's zero, so it's plus or minus 28 degrees, so you need to correct that. So you can you, you can get away with a little bit of, uh, you, you can, it's like one axis which is full control, the other axis partial control. But what about if you have like a sensor, like in this case you can use two star trackers for two different sites, and you know, they both can work. If this is my sensor. Not, not star tracker, star tracker would oh, be sorry. way too expensive, sun, sun sensor. Sun sensors. So there's one on this side. Can you use your microphone, please? 
So, so there is one on this side. Yeah. And then when this is on the back side, then there's one should be on this side. Well, it should not be the back side. It should be, it you, should as you go up, you're, you're rotating. Oh, okay. You're rotating. You want to be, you want to be in full power all the time. Right. So, so okay. you will not, if you face the other side, that means you're, you shouldn't be, as you go around, you're, you're always facing. So it's, it's like a uh, Ferris wheel, right? right? You're always facing that. And but Ferris wheel has a free hinge that keeps yes. that thing. So here also you need something like that. That is what the axis is. Ah, okay. That's what your gimbal is. Right. So the whole satellite can be put on gimbal. Uh, some well, not a whole satellite because again, in this case, you don't want this whole thing to move because this one is doing, I want, I'm, this this one is uh, docking to the space station. So here, uh, my, my target is to... Oh, no, 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 no. For this one, I completely understand. Like uh, the same thing with the space for the other satellite because what happens? Well, we have a SOHO and SD. In this case, because these sound. these antennas are pointing at a certain place. Right. These are always data pointing. So this way, this point is a is a gimbal. Right. So this is rotating, but these antennas are pointing always on the ground. Yeah. At the same time, the thrust is pointing in the opposite direction. All the time. So that's why you need more art these articulating mechanisms. Everybody is pointing in different directions, uh, depending on what you need. And this can be basically, you don't need an active system, it just can be controlled this by... This is an active system. Oh, so you, okay. This is an active system, because you, you can't not have, it has to, you got to measure what it is and you... Excuse me guys, can you make sure when you ask a question you use the microphone and that it's on? Oh, it's on? Yeah. Oh, there's, oh, the battery is low for the microphone. Can you hear that now? I guess you... Can you hear the uh, mic microphone? We can hear yours, Professor, but the folks mm -hmm. talking in the back. Battery, um, battery is low. Okay, I think the, uh, we are trying to do that. I think the battery of the microphone is okay. dead. Okay, we'll try to get another microphone. Sorry about that. I, I, we thought that you were still, the guys on the net are still hearing the question, but I guess the battery is of the microphone is dead. Correct. Uh, <coughs> gets to him, it's the problem. discussing was that how do you make sure the arrays are pointed to the sun at all times? Yes, they're all gimbal. Uh, they're, they're different axes of tracking. Typically, for, 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 for just, like, just like space station, for most LEO programs, most LEO programs, you end up with two axes tracking. So you, you, as, you, as you go around the Earth, you know, and it's pretty close, you, you, can't, you can't afford to move the spacecraft too much because you're really doing some job that's why you're trying to fly, you're collecting data or communicate, doing something, uh, either pointing uh, to Earth or looking somewhere else. And the spacecraft and the arrays have to move, do whatever they can without disturbing the payload. And you've got to, you've got to then point it to the sun. And yeah, the question, the other question that you asked was, which was the microphone went away. Is it all active or passive? The answer is yes, they are, these are active systems, in other words, you're measuring where the sun is through sun sensors, which is core sun sensors, or actually solar, solar cell itself is a sun sensor. It's a very simple sun sensor. And uh, so you measure it and then use that to, to control the spacecraft. Again, it's controlled through the spacecraft flight control. So, um, power system analysis under different operational modes, which is showing this launch control room. Um, where we control all these modes. This is the picture of the launch control room in Houston for space station. Um, so the loads analysis, right? Um, as I said, so before we do this whole system, we've got to understand what the loads are and, and the type of loads. So the loads could be, it could be resistive loads or constant power loads. Again, we need to understand what the load profile is, the peak, duty cycle, orbital average. So if you look at this, that's the power profile uh, and the load criticality length. 
How critical is that look? Criticality of a spacecraft processor, computer, is much, much higher than a transponder. If a voltage drops down, if I'm starved of power, guess what I'm going to turn off first? Transponder. So what I do is, what you do is you take every piece of load that you have, you assign criticality there. So when you, when you have problems, you know who you can start sharing. You realize that the last thing you ever want to share is the, 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 the space time. So again, criticality level is important. Applicable modes, your sound loads are on and on, only in the certain modes, not all the time, and the voltage you call. So the, here are some of the, I showed this earlier, but this is kind of just summarize of, uh, so power, uh, so the, so the battery uh, balance, ampere hours in is recharge ratio times ampere hours out. So that's that. The power for charging is solar minus load. That's how much you need. So again, some of these equations that we have, again, for is required for, again, we've done this, uh, uh, most of this earlier. Also, we've done example. Uh, I tend not to go with a lot of the equation because they, they don't really, I, I want to go with first principles. Most examples that I've gone through is basically without even knowing this, um, these equations, logically one goes to the whole system design and we get over the same. So it's, but just for reference, here are the equations that we need. What is V sub CH? Sub CH is the current voltage or what? Yeah. VCH. VCH is voltage at during charge time. During charge time. Yeah. And this is voltage, which is the same, same similarly voltage during discharge or time of charge. And RR stands for what? At the bottom, RR. RR? Yeah. RR recharge ratio. You know, for example, I've got a, um, a battery I'm charging. I'm charging, say, 10 amps, amp hours. Uh, sorry, if I have a battery which is and I take out 10 amp hours. Ideally, I need to fill up 10 amp hours. But these lithium ion is pretty good. That should be pretty much ideal. But nickel hydrogen is not. You have to charge, say, 12 amp hours to be able to get 10 amp hours. So there's a recharge ratio. That is what this is. That means you've got to charge, say, 1.2 times. But that's overcharging. No, it's not overcharging. This is that means. No, that is that means that there's in a, that is the in, oh, almost okay. related in a fish. Right, right. In lithium ion, as I said, so you said there is a loss. There is a ratio loss. Actually, in lithium ion is one. There is a loss in charging, but that's why you have to get like twelve. Because the battery doesn't yeah. it doesn't accept all the charge. It doesn't. What you put in is not what you can get out. But it's not out of the tolerance of charging. No. That's over. Again, the yeah. recharge ratio is also a function of the battery type. As I said, for lithium ion, the recharge ratio is one. We all make efficient batteries, almost 100% efficient batteries. Nickel hydrogen is about 1.2. 1.2 to 1.2, <coughs> somewhere around 1.2. Can the charging be um, detrimental? Again, can you, sorry, can you use the mic yeah. microphone, please? <laughs> so, before, let, let me uh, clarify that. Uh, the question earlier was what's the, what's the recharge ratio, and the recharge ratio, as I said, is right. efficiency. Uh, and, it's, I it's, 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 and then I asked, um, That'd be great. It's not if it's, it's the amount of charge that you put in. You never get 100% out. But right. for lithium ion, this is, this is one. For nickel hydrogen, recharge ratio is about 1.2. And I ask, can be the, um, is it the uh, recharging detrimental to the battery or not? Why yes. So charge, discharge, we talked about, I mean, we talked about that. You talked about overcharging, how, how, how can Yeah, be maybe I did not. Uh, but good you didn't point. talk about the point. So, yeah, I think I did not talk about. So the charge, so every just every charge discharge cycle. So there are two. Okay, if I did not mention earlier, let me repeat again. For battery, there are two lights that is important. We look at two different light things. One is what is called a calendar light. I have to. If I'm not doing anything, if I vacuum battery and I, without doing anything, or if I have constant load and I put it out for. Five years, ten years, or two years. 
That's the current life. But this, that's one life. Second is, so there is a degradation for the current life. Then the other thing is, how many charge discharges? So if I have the cell phone, if I charge it and put a discharge it 10 times per day versus doing it once every week, when I do 10 times a day, the life will go down much worse. So this, that's what is called the cycle life. So there's a degradation. There's a character life degradation, there's a cycle life degradation. So basically, the depth of the charge will be also varying due as time goes Absolutely. On. So that is why now in Leo, you see a lot more cycles. So you take about 5,000 cycles in five years, uh, or 5,000 cycles in uh, per year, actually. Uh, Whereas, uh, because every, an hour, every uh, an hour and a half you see one cycle, so you see about 18 cycles per day, so you multiply by that over four, uh, uh, by, you know, 365 uh, days, you end up with uh, almost um, uh, 5,000 cycles that you end up with uh, per year, only. Whereas in geo, you see there's only a total of 90 atmospheres and even then only two worst case. So basically 90 times 15, you're ending up with about 1,500, about 1,500 cycles per year, per, per the entire mission. So the back is, so I can now, so a degradation because the cycle is much less in the geo. So how do I account for that? So my, so I, I, I that's why my DOD is much higher for the geo mission I cannot afford to go 80% DOD because <laughs> for, Leo. for Leo because this is going to crash very soon. So I don't know if I discussed all this during the yeah, last yeah. part, but that's an important one. One more last question. Uh, so, um, again, some of these equations. Sorry, uh, the max, so the max charge rate and Triple yeah. charge, they, they still remain the same <coughs> as mission goes down, right? They shouldn't yes. be varying that much. Max charge rate and minimum and, and effective charge rate. And I think in the example that I gave, max charge rate is really important because that determines, uh, and actually, I, I, I don't know if I gave you some of the examples. Because we, what you want to do is to in one of the examples, I asked you to calculate the total solar array size. Mm -hmm. And you notice that if your mass charge rate is high, you need to have more charging power, which means my solar array goes up much higher. So what does that mean? And then I also asked you to calculate the time. So I, what we don't want to do is to, you know, for example, um, uh, the total duration there. You, you, you go to a, a, a charging station and you charge so fast, you, you're taking a lot of power from the circuit. Or if the solar array is that big because you're, you're pumping a lot of current. But then, then I have two hours to wait. It's not the right thing. So best thing is to reduce the, you keep the charge, max charge rate just right, so you can do the charging in the available time, and not more. Because if you do it higher, I'm, I'm over-designing the system. I'm putting a much bigger solar array. I'm charging the battery much faster, although I don't need it. So that's why the exercise I gave, gave you was, OK, calculate the time. Now, so here's another example. If I have a geo mission versus a Leo mission. In geo, I have this total mission is uh, 24 hours. Maximum eclipse period is 1.2 yeah. hours. That means the worst case, in the worst case eclipse, I still have 22.8 hours left for it to fully charge. So I have plenty of time. That's why I gave the example to figure out peak rate and then trickle charge and make sure. Then, then the idea was to check whether that time <coughs> is enough for the next hour. What happens in Leo? Leo is an hour and a half, one hour in sunlight. And I'm ready for another half hour of cycle. So I only have one hour to charge the battery. Less than that. Less, yeah, Four less than that. Oh, Four and a half minutes. So that means, that's why the solar, for, for Leo, the solar rays go up a lot because you have to charge the battery very quickly to meet the battery. 
the battery becomes huge. So again, that trade goes on. And again, in the example that, you know, and, and this is a good thing I have, always check back and uh, to see that your, your charge rates are such that A, you, you, you are able to do this in time, and, and B, not overdoing it, not doing it too fast, and making the solar way too big. So I might give you an example to say, okay, um, how do we do, how, how do you, for example, uh, uh, I might give an example to say, uh, with this certain charge rate, find out what the time is, and is this a right design? So what that I mean is, you look at the time, uh, you, look, you calculate the time and say, okay, well, for Leo, hey, I end up with, I require, um, uh, with that particular charge rate, I'm ending up with, say, an hour and a half to charge the battery. Obviously, that's not the charge rate because I can't afford one hour and a half. I have to do it within, within one hour before the next trip has to come. So what I need to do is increase the charge rate to, to be able to do it. Vice versa, if I have too much time, I can relax. So that's, so beware that you might be asked that question. Right? <laughs> Any example. Intent. Okay? Again, I'm not going to go through this example. These are, some, these are the same equations, and we've gone through all these. These are some equations for all these things, but we've actually gone through, uh, but I'm leaving this in the notebooks that we are doing a detailed calculation, you want to build detailed spreadsheets, there are some equations here. But what I've shown in, in the given examples are point design, but same same principles apply. Can you talk about the harness resistance? Sure. Can you? Can you talk about the harness resistance? Okay. So, harness resistance. So, if from a battery, if there's harness, there's always harness in everything. So, you always have to, you can't assume this to be harness resistance zero because there's a voltage drop across it. There's some loss across it. So you if you if you don't account for this harness resistance and the voltage drop across it or the you will not have the power because you 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 will not have the power proper power uh, for during charge and discharge. And so you need to really we work out these so again that's what I'm saying your prediction models have to when you go into a lot more detail, yes always because these numbers, plus because you have a huge battery, huge current because voltages are low, massive currents, so these voltage and the I, I squared R losses in these harnesses are pretty significant. So always make sure, account for the harness losses. And, and, and depending on where the solar array is operating, you need to then take that piece of harness. So be, be careful what piece of harness will be active during that particular point and account for that in your So typical, this is one example. When I do, this is, I showed you one which is the solar ray curve. But what we do is, uh, I end up with a very detailed Excel sheet where we look at, or put all the loads. And, and I start again with the end of life parameters. So that's the condition we want to meet. At the end of life, okay, and you know, 100, 100 volt payload, how much is it? In this case, I'm given by the customer, I need to provide, because I don't know, I'm not designing the payload, customer tells me, give me a spacecraft, a bus system, a power system, which can meet, which, and I'm gonna give you a payload, which is 14.154 kilowatt. He may have told some margins there, I don't know. But that's what we design to, because we don't. And then 30 volt payload, in this case is zero. Then, uh, now, now these are some of the things that I can, we know, for, the RF load, which is 204 volts. Added control system, 194 watts, sorry, of course. Added control system required. And again, summary one, in, in, in under each one of them, what we do is do a very detailed, um, maybe I'll show you one of those. Because these spectrums are very complicated. Detailed. And you list each and every item, and not only that, I also take, see which, which bus is it connected to, what the TRL level is, and then I assign the right margins necessary at this point. So ending up with, this is the total power that I need. In this case, thermal control is one kilowatt power electronics as are not 100% efficient. So there's some losses there. And 
lucky in this case load margin. Am I not holding any load margin? I normally put this in a separate line item so we don't put it. So here I'm saying I'm not putting any load margin. So my total load now is 15.7 uh, kilowatts. And normally this, I'm, I, I want to keep this a different season. This is during June, sunlight. Okay, keep this, uh, uh, I'll get fired, this is electrical uh, during this, is, this is when you have, uh, so again, ignore this for the time. During sunlight, during uh, in June, same load during September, uh, uh, sun, sunlight time is this one, because now you have other things happening, because again, here, the, you can see the thermal load has gone up significantly. And then during eclipse time. So at least these three columns you need to know. June, September, eclipse, these are the worst kind of cases that we have. Eclipse, so now I know in this case, again, thermal load has changed. Payload is always the same. So now I know what my, pay, what my loads are at any uh, at different seasons. And then, let's look at the, the, the losses uh, and charging, right? How much battery charge, uh, 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 in this case, I'm charging the batteries. This is the battery charge power. This is the IPC, which is the power electronics. This is a charge loss. This is a BCC loss, delivered. This is BDC, the battery discharge converter loss. In this case, since I'm charging, there's no discharge converter loss. But here, there will be discharge converter loss. Okay? And again, depending on what the efficiency of those two systems are. And again, battery harness loss. Again, it's not charging, but here you can see, again, I put some battery harness. So depending on what those, so. And every mode, depending on what is active, you make a very detailed list. So now, I'm, uh, my total losses, are almost 600 watts in loss during this time. And uh, during September, almost 1.7 kilowatts loss. Okay, so I know what, what the total loads are, what the loss, I have to add them together because I have to make up for those losses. So the total power required at bus is these two together. That's how much I'm, I've got to generate. What's the source capability? Now this, with that, the source capability, um, the diode losses, um, so here, again, I designed the solar array, again, I ended up with, let's say, 20 kilowatts of array, um, and these are all the losses during that time. So net, my net source capability is 50 to 90 points. And then I also put the, the charge current, the current required. So this, that's the power that, I, uh, uh, that I'm getting, um, charge current, uh, and charge uh, uh, current available is so much. And then look at the difference in here. This is how much I, I, I need. This is how much I need, this is how much I'm generating, and I look at the power. This is the power margin I'm calculating at this point. So, at, at any snap, not, snapshot in time, in the worst case, in June time frame, I, I know what how much power margin I have in this case. And I can also do the same thing for total battery capacity and max battery DOD is only 17% in this case. So it's okay. And then max, max and, uh, but again here, because it's, uh, it's hardly um, dipping into the battery, you actually have charging. In the, uh, in the sunlight in the September case, that's the total power available. I've got 7.7% margin on solar array. But in this case, I've said, the customer wants 10% margin. That means I have to give him that 10% margin. So uh, the overall margin is 17.7, take away 10, so uh, this is 7.5% is my design margin. And then similarly here, when you go into the uh, eclipse period, of course, there's no sun, sun margin. And I calculate the with numbers uh, printed for cell, which means with the failures, I'm en ending up with 54.8% DOD for the batteries. So how can we measure the max battery DOD while on the r -fit? Oh, you mean how do you measure it? Oh, okay. How do I measure the back actual DOD? Is um, remember when I was talking about the lithium-ion cells? Uh, the best 
way to measure the state of charge of the battery is voltage. Remember, the, remember in the, um, the, the, the charge discharge curve of, of lithium ion is pretty much like this. So when you discharge, you're ending up with So, if I have a nickel hydrogen battery, thank you. So, if you remember in the battery section, the nickel hydrogen is like this. Actually, it's more. Okay. So, this is about. 4.1 volts, it's about 4 volts, and then this, this is about um, 2 point, about 3 volts. And this is against, this is state of charge versus uh, battery voltage, or lithium ion cell voltage. Cell. Now, uh, this is about about six, six, 60 or 70 percent SOC. Let's say six or 70 percent, and this is about 100 100 percent. So we are operating typically in this region, and this region is up to a straight line. So, or if I can measure this voltage, I can. I know pretty well what the state of charge. Actually, this is the very this is the beauty of lithium ion battery. The easiest thing you can measure is voltage. But DOD is not equal to 1 minus SOC. Approximately the price. Yes. Pretty much. You, yeah, pretty much. Better than making that the environment. Yeah, but it's, it's, if you know how much that is, you, you can characterize that up in the testing. So you figure pretty, you have a very good idea. In, lit, in nickel hydrogen, it's not as simple. Because in, lit, in, lithium, in nickel hydrogen, the state of charge is really uh, is a uh, is a function um, is a function of uh, temperature, pressure, and a couple other things. And it's not it's really a nonlinear function too. This you got to calculate it in, in a slightly different way. But in, lith in, in lithium ion, it's pretty true now. So just almost a straight line. So that's how we measure it. So you have a pretty good idea of what the DOD is and what the state of charge is. And then you can regulate it, so you don't leave it because you can you can control the charge currents, and you can control all this. So you make sure you don't dip below that. But here again, this is a simple example of a power budget under normal operating mode, under sunlight in June, in eclipse uh, in uh, in September, and eclipse mode. And these are typical parameters. Now, under each one of those, there could be you could have a lot more detail. So this is typically what. Uh, again, uh, to be able to get those loads, here's one I'm just trying to show, like payload instruments, and then telemetry instruments, energy control, then they would be maybe 15, 20 lines under like energy control. There are, you, have, you, you have your reaction wheels, you have star cameras, you have uh, spacecraft processors, you've got all those things, you've got to risk each one of them, and depending on what mode of operation it is, you calculate all those powers, and you list them together. And again, you can put what voltage it is and how much margin are you putting. I always do this separately, and each one of them, how much margin am I adding? Again, depending on TRL, and depending on complexity, on how much, in both the percentage and in watts. So this is power plus margin. So again, you build an Excel table, again, of the loads, of, and then B 
beginning of life of a tortoise, beginning of life uh, of autumn equinox, June, September, and then um, a beginning of life eclipse, end of life. So I need to know what beginning of life is, end of life. So you, you build this table, you've got a pretty good idea of what the total loads are. And again, here's, these are actual examples. I pulled it out from an analysis sheet. You always see this kind of same thing. Look at all these different loads. Um, you know, again, 15 years summer, summer solstice, 15 years autumn equinox, and etc. So you can see the three, three cases we do it all the time. Again, some more. This is the structures. Thermal group, all kinds of heaters and pyro. So again, these are long lists. So you, you want again your accuracy depends on how how much detail you want to get into. Uh, a simple load summary. Again, here uh, um, this is a load summary. But in this case, you may have a electric propulsion in this or zips. Uh, so when it is off, this is the power load. When it is on, it is firing. Again, here we can see when I have uh, zips on, then uh, payload is this much, and then um, yeah, you have a pretty significant load on uh, at its control. So here this is hardly any, and then you got almost 2.4 kilowatts coming on. Similarly, it's the same. So we, again, this is another way you can look at. Um, what is XIPS? XIPS is the electric is zips zips is xenon ion propulsion system. Electrical load. Similarly, here this is a, 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 a sample of the, the electrical the the losses of each system. Um, same thing for source side. I'm, I'm giving the source capability. That's how much it is sun. But then there's some solar cell failures. I have to say, okay, I, I need to design for two solar circuit failures. So that translates to the 68 watts. Uh, off sun pointing, the question was, what if you're not pointing exactly? So there's a cosine loss. So depending on, the, so I have to account for this. In this case, I'm perfectly pointed. So, but if I have a line item to show that, then you, it makes you think that, yeah, please account for that. So there's, if there's an off pointing, you're going to have some cosine loss. Um, there is an SWP gain or loss between the solar wind drives, the gimbals, may lose something. There may be some, so I would list it as catalogs. We talked about this. So in this case, yeah, I'm taking over 82, 82 watts of catalog during this phase. And again, harness loss. And harness loss is pretty significant. It's almost the same as two circuit failures. And these are actually right real number for actual program. So um, the diode loss. Uh, in these, because they, you know you want to bring diodes, you don't want so there again it's a pretty significant loss in there. So this is all the load source summary, and again your margins. So again harnessing, you know we need to look at solar array. So they're harnessing everywhere. There are diodes all over the place because you want to make sure your fault currents go don't go back. So you model where this fault current these diodes are. And the, the, every diode has a huge loss in the system. So we, what we do is you have a full harness model that you need to understand. And then you use that piece of harness that's required. For, for example, from you, you're going from, from main bus to these loads, all these loads harnessing them coming into play. So just, just an example to show that, we, that all that needs to be accounted for. And then again, this is a parameter which shows uh, an example of, you know, basically building the whole model and then actually capturing the data in different format. I showed you an Excel format. Some people like to capture this, each element, and so, and then you can build it in the Excel sheet or, uh, uh, or in the MATLAB or something like that. And then you're ending up with a lot of different ways of showing the decimal loads. I mean, here is a, um, a power curve, solar array curve, of course, IV curves is the power curve, and then you look at, um, uh, you know, all all the different types of 
ways you can show the battery function. There are a variety of ways you are you can output the uh, the output power uh, accounts, and again, everybody does it differently. Um, here is an example of a very simple case where you have a uh, a CubeSat which is not deployed, which now is rotating. Or so here it's a very different one again. Uh, this is a module. This is your battery uh, system, and here is your solar array uh, model in. And this is the electronics that go with it. This is the your charge controllers, um, and this is your electronics that goes with it. So again, a power uh, example, and all these parameters that you you model and you. And then you can calculate the harnessing, the, the batteries, and all that stuff. You know, I'm showing this basically because power systems come in all shapes and sizes. I mean, they're all different things. And so those same elements apply no matter which way you go. Here's another one for some space tech uh, program. Same thing. Here's your uh, solar array gimbals. Uh, Coming in, this is a shunt regulator. Here I have a peak power tracker. Maximum MPPT is the maximum power uh, point tracker. So this is a different controller. And again, you can build this model very easily. In next, in uh, this is a model that's built in MATLAB, and you. What does that do? Maximum power point tracker. Maximum power track point tracker is remember when I came and talked way back in, in the power in the power system control. What you can do is, you know. Solar arrays, IV curve is like this, right? This is your big power, but this is a nice benign curve. This is fine, but as you as you go through various places, you know when your temperature changes, this moves pretty widely. Yeah, it moves a little bit up here, not so much, but this it moves a lot. In other words. Solar array, the IV curve can move all the way from here to here. This is the peak po point, right? Now just imagine your peak, you know, here, your po peak power is this much, here it, it drops significantly. So there are different ways of controlling it. Uh, for If I'm having a mission which is where the temperature is changing dramatically or it's moving all kinds of things, you want to be able to track what that point is and always operate at the maximum power point. There's a different, the way you do that electronics is different. This particular case is an electronic system. Is the way it's really, yeah, you're, you're tracking this. Uh, for the geo systems, typically what we do is, because this doesn't vary that much because you're operating in a, a fixed environment, what we do is you typically end up when you say, okay, this is your peak power point, this is your V load, this is your load point. Remember we talked about load point? Mm -hmm. And we fix it just below the peak power point. And you keep it fixed, you don't vary. Because peak power tracker is a little bit more complex and, and again, everything you add on, this can be unreliable too. If this fails, you lose control. Plus, it loses about two to three percent, four percent power. So, but it, if you are varying a lot, it's worth doing the peak power, peak power tracker. That's in this case, that's what it's done. What is also GMBH? This well, this one is a is a German program. It's a specific program that I just I took an acting example and. Again, some results. You know, all you can. There are all kinds of things that you. We literally look at the IV curve and different things. Also, battery. We look at very carefully the battery performance over a number of years, and and then match up with the load conditions. Here's you're ending up with this kind of thing. Here's a um, again one particular program. You can see. Again, you do it over the life you, as the things move on. What the battery is doing what the loads are doing, and, and you come up with this very detailed simulation to make sure at all times you are, everything is behaving exactly right. <coughs> but I mean, it's, it's simple, it looks complicated, but essentially the elements are the same. You can take a, you can take, what I showed you was, some of those says you take one point in line and you calculate it, and you take the two worst cases. As long as you take the two worst cases, it's good enough for preliminary design. And then you can do detail. But, but the thing is, for LEO missions, you end up in the quarter group because LEO changes a lot. This is a typical LEO program. It's another uh, example of um, you know, an Excel sheet that I put together for a 
case where you have battery in the bus, really, for Leo, where your, your bus voltage is controlled by the battery voltage there. Professor, you have three minutes remaining. Okay. more examples uh, of that particular thing. Uh, okay, then transfer orbit analysis. Again, this was when you when you're in the transfer orbit mode, basically I think I showed some of these charts before. But here this the because it is cubed, the solar is not deployed, you're only end, ending up with this kind of mode. And some of the equations I'm just putting it for reference. Here is some transfer orbit analysis, actual analysis for a particular mission that I did. Um, same thing, lunar eclipse cases. Um, safe world analysis when you have loose control, you need to make sure under emergency conditions, which is another case, you know, for example, I call it zombie satellite, satellite is lost. You have lost control. So you, but you need to be able to make sure you take care of you have enough power margins here in this case where you have you have problem and you don't know what it is. You have by the time you figure it out. So this is this certain um, certain analysis that's required to do this. I'm going to put all that in the chart, but again, uh, there will be no questions asked, guaranteed, in, in for these cases because those are special cases. All you know, need to know, for example, for exams are really nominal cases, and to be able to do that. It. Sorry about that. It's gone really fast, but I think uh, it gives you an idea of the flavor. And I think we've done some analysis of individual points, uh, summer solstice, October and equinox. Those three cases that's important in the eclipse path. And, uh, and you can a lot of that you can do. In fact, the majority of the work for the geo application certainly you can do by itself. Very simple calculations. Even for Leo, you can do some of the analysis. Course, uh, yes. Final will only be on the course material. There will be no